I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. And I am just simply delighted to see all of you here with us this evening. It is wonderful to see so many familiar faces and to have had the opportunity to meet some new friends of the school as well. Well, before I introduce our speakers this evening, it is a great pleasure to thank Mr. Glenn Goldberg, who was the president of McGraw-Hill's Financial Commodities and Commercial Markets, for so graciously arranging this truly lovely venue for our event this evening. I also wanted to thank the City Foundation for their continued support of our lecture series. Well, tonight it is a great honor to introduce two very distinguished statesmen who served together in the Ford administration, the Honorable Dr. Henry Kissinger and the Honorable Paul O'Neill. Well, you'll see from their biographies in the program that both of our speakers have had a number of key positions um, in both private sector and, of course, in public service as well. Dr. Kissinger is, of course, an icon in the fields of international relations and American foreign policy. A recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, Dr. Kissinger is chairman of the international consulting firm Kissinger Associates, and he also served as the 56th Secretary of State and National Security Advisor to President Nixon and President Ford. Both a diplomat and a scholar, Dr. Kissinger's opinions continue to be sought after on matters of foreign policy and national security, as you well know. Dr. Kissinger also recently celebrated his 90th birthday, and it is a great pleasure to wish him many happy returns on this occasion as well. <laughs> Mr. O'Neill served as the 72nd Secretary of the Treasury. He joined the White House Office of Management and Budget in 1967 and served as the Deputy Director of OMB during the Ford administration. He was chairman and CEO of Alcoa until his retirement, as well as chairman of the Rand Corporation. Mr. O'Neill has been a very good friend to the Ford School as well, and he was a leader among the generous donors who helped us to build the wonderful Weill Hall. And just <coughs> last month, he delivered the charge to the class of 2013, and we very much appreciated that. Our students. Our speakers have agreed to discuss their experiences serving in the Ford administration and also their opinions on current events and um, issues that are extremely topical. But before they begin, I'd like to explain just very briefly why the Ford School has decided to host the event this evening. Well, as many of you know, 2013 marks the 100th anniversary of President Ford's birth. And tonight's event continues the Ford School's year-long celebration of President Ford's remarkable life and career. The naming of the University of Michigan School of Public Policy for President Ford in 1999 was really a key transformational event that um, linked us both to a great man whose decency and commitment to public service continues to inspire our students and broader members of our community today, but that naming also created an energy and a momentum that has allowed us to continue hiring top tier faculty, to launch an undergraduate degree program, and to build Weill Hall. Well, now we are just a few months away from our next transformational effort, and that is that in 2014, the Ford School will recognize another centennial, the 100th anniversary of our school's founding. This milestone arrives at the start of a university-wide effort to secure funds that will significantly enhance the student experience on campus and will invest in the next century of citizens, public servants, and leaders trained at the Ford School. While many members of the Ford School Committee who have helped us to set that path are in the room tonight, and we're delighted to have them here with us, we hope that our commemoration of these back-to-back -back centennials will inspire all of you to join the Friends of the Ford School as active supporters in the coming months and the years of the campaign. Well, your printed program and the slideshow that played during the reception, and I hope you had a chance to see a number of the pictures of our students and the activities in our facilities. Um, they really highlight that year-long celebration. And across all of these centennial events, it has been a real pleasure to meet friends and colleagues of President Ford. I'd like to highlight that friends and colleagues um, description. President Ford's colleagues really continue to consider him a friend. 
And whether it was across the aisle or across a nation, President Ford really had a gift for bringing people together. Dr. Kissinger, I think that you articulated that sentiment in the naming of the Ford School in 2000. And at that point, you said, and I quote, that Washington is about power. It's very rare, indeed it's unheard of, that so many people who were associated with the Ford administration were friends then and have remained friends throughout the remainder of their lives. And here tonight, we have two lifelong friends of President Ford. We also have an audience full of people whose own friendships began at the Ford School. And so Dr. Kissinger and Mr. O'Neill, I think it's safe to say that that very important legacy of many of President Ford's is still alive and well. And now for the main event. Here is our format. Dr. Kissinger and Mr. O'Neill will start their conversation on the legacy of President Ford, and then they will move on to a discussion of some of today's top policy issues. They'll save the last 20 minutes of the time for questions and answers and discussion with the audience. And so with no further ado, it is my great honor to turn the floor over to Paul O'Neill. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dean Collins. Uh, it's re really a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, I should tell you, uh, Dr. Kissinger is wonderful in so many different ways. He's got a vocal cord problem, so he's protecting his voice. Um, but he was good enough, even with this new thing that he's not old enough to have, that uh, he found his way here tonight. So. It's so wonderful to see you, Henry. I think it would be uh, useful at the beginning maybe to pick up on a little conversation we were having before we came in. Uh, Henry, if you first, and, and then I will follow you. Talk a little bit about President Ford, the man that you worked with, and, and how you saw him then and see him in retrospect. Well, uh, I've known 10 presidents. And one of the main characteristics of presidents is that they spend a great deal of their life in pursuit of the office. And so whatever their differences, um, they're very conscious of public opinion. Uh, they're very concerned. It's increasingly, as time has gone on, this was not so true, uh, I would say, of Eisenhower, but uh, as a, they're, they're very concerned with such things as focus groups. And uh, Ford never expected to be president, never thought to be president. He was transported into it by a catastrophe. and. Uh, the expectations were not high because he had had no executive experience. And he took over at a moment when uh, the administration was in a shambles. Our position internationally extremely difficult because so much depends on, uh, on uh, credibility. Uh, and countries from all over the world looking at him to see what he might do next. The outstanding characteristic of President Ford was that what you saw was what you got. You did not have to worry. Uh, uh, he did not maneuver. Uh, uh, he did not care about focus groups. Uh, one of the actually big mistakes we made in that sense uh, I told him at, in, it was in April 76, before most of you were born, uh, <laughs> there was an issue in Southern Africa. And I said to him, we have to put ourselves on the side of majority rule in Rhodesia and Namibia. And I said, I was Secretary of State, I said, I'm planning to go there. And, uh, uh, in whenever the date. And I realized that this is two weeks 
before the Texas primary. And if you want me to, I can put it off a few months. He said, no, we're not making the foreign policy dependent on my primary. And the primary was a disaster because in Texas, they were not for majority rule in Rhodesia and Namibia in those days. Uh, but he made strong decisions. He created a warm atmosphere. Uh, he uh, had no obsessions about camera angles, all the things you read about now. Or that, that which, uh, it was not a rehearsed presidency. It was a, a Midwest uh, a figure who did what he thought was best for his country. And as I said, I've known 10 presidents. This is not to talk them down. They all uh, were men of, of substance. But Ford was in the human category by himself. And as it turned out, well equipped for the job because he had been on the uh, Armed Services Committee so he knew a lot about the uh, security aspect of foreign policy. And uh, one of the, uh, again from the foreign policy side, interesting things is uh, as a Midwesterner from a relatively small town, he was exactly the sort of guy that European intellectual leaders might look down on as naive. But as it turned out, he became a close personal friend of people like Helmut Schmidt, Ritzka de Stein, uh, through the rest of his life, when he could do nothing for them. But they went all the way out to Denver or to Aspen uh, year after year. Trudeau from <coughs> Canada, who was, if I may say so, somewhat snobbish, <laughs> and his, uh, he became a good friend. But when we get to the questions, I'd be glad to answer. Okay, well, good. Uh, so let me reminisce just uh, a little bit <coughs> as well about uh, my connection with President Ford. I, I was, um, long ago, I was a graduate student in public policy at Indiana University. It's another place you may have heard of. Um, and I came into the government actually in <coughs> 1961. Uh, it sounds uh, maybe naive now, but you know, and Kennedy said, if you, if you want to make a difference, come here and help. So I did. I, I didn't know that you weren't supposed to respond. <laughs> so, so I went, you know. And um, fortunately, I got uh, recruited into what was the Bureau of the Budget in 19, January of 1967 because President Johnson at the time uh, called in the director of the Bureau of the Budget and said to Charlie Schultz, Charlie, <coughs> I really like what Bob McNamara is doing at the Defense Department with cost-benefit analysis and program planning and budgeting, and I want you to bring those ideas to the domestic activities of the government. And so Charlie set out to hire some people with backgrounds and economics and operations research, and, and uh, I was one of those people that got recruited to come and help install the McNamara ideas in the domestic part of government. So in a, in a parallel track, President Ford served 25 years in the Congress, and he was on the, uh, he was there 25 years, served 23 years on the Appropriations Committee. And he was fascinated by the appropriations process because it gave him a way to relate how we were spending our money on different things. And he became arguably the best educated programmatic expert about government that we've had for a president. Harry Truman had some similar claims because of his time in the Congress. But a lot of young people especially do not understand what a thoughtful, knowledgeable person President Ford was about everything the government was doing. And so 
when he was still vice president, I'll never forget, he called me in and said, he wanted me to explain the economics of clover leaves on interstate highway systems and what kind of businesses would be attracted and what would happen to property values. And that's how his mind worked. He was, he was not an idle kind of uh, observer of what was going on. He was into the details and he wanted to understand the facts of what programs worked, why they worked, which ones didn't work. And uh, so when he became president and asked me to be the deputy director of OMB, you know, in that 29 months, I must have spent three, uh, 300 hours sitting at the corner of his desk, uh, talking with him, others present, as whatever their specialties were, uh, discussing how to allocate resources against all the competing needs in the federal government. And, you know, I never forget one night about 10 o'clock after we'd been at it for what seemed like forever, there was a line, I'll never forget, $15 million increase for retired military pay. And he said to me, Paul, wh why is this $15 million here? And I said, you know, Mr. President, I don't remember. And he loved the fact I didn't know the answer to a question because I thought it was my God-given duty to know the answer to every question he could ask before he could think to ask it. He never let me forget the $15 million retired military budget increase that I didn't remember. We changed the assumption about actuarial things and that's what produced the $15 million. But he was unbelievably interested in the details and the depth and, you know, I said uh, <coughs> on the occasion when I was at the, <coughs> the Ford School, he would be appalled to hear people talking about deciding what percent of GDP we ought to spend on national defense because he knew how many people we needed in each of the uniform services from an analysis of threats and working with Dr. Kissinger and his own accumulation of knowledge over time. He knew how many aircraft we needed. He knew how much money we ought to spend on investments in new technology. A lot of the technology we have now, the stealth bombers, they came out of his administration's investment in research and development. And he understood at the same time that money we spent on national security issues was money we couldn't spend on other important public policy needs. So he weighed all those things really carefully. I tell you, it was, um, the greatest experience to work with someone so clear-headed and devoted to the country and to doing the right thing. And, you know, I, I never ever in the time I spent with President Ford saw him diminish another human being <laughs> by his word or by his action. He was an uplifter of people. You know, just a fabulous, wonderful person. And I take personal pride in the fact that the school is now the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy because I honestly think it is the most meaningful, lasting recognition of his life because young people hopefully will carry his values forward from the training they get at the Ford School at the University of Michigan. So, Henry. We should talk about uh, current affairs. And I said to you earlier, I'm sure this audience is uh, knowledgeable about everything that's going on, uh, but I personally w would like to uh, hear your thoughts on the situation in Syria, which is, well, you know, I was thinking about this coming over. Maybe it's a function of getting old, but it used to be, I think you could name the hot spots in the world where things were unraveling and there was civil unrest. I think you have to have a, a, an Excel <laughs> spreadsheet now. There are so many of them. So, Henry, talk to us about Syria. Well, that's the problem of Syria. And that's the problem of the United States. And I put it that way because we have great difficulty understanding 
societies like the Syrian society. And we have great problems as a country of understanding the relationship between diplomacy and power and democracy. Uh, and therefore, uh, if I taught a course on policy making, I always would say, you begin with an analysis. You have to begin explaining where you are. And then you have to follow it with objectives. What are you, tr where are you, and what are you trying to do? And then you have, of course, to discuss the means. But we have had great trouble uh, about Syria in this sense. When we see Syria on a map, we say, oh, OK, it's a country. It has these borders. Uh, first of all, Syria is not a historic state. It was created in its present shape in 1920. Uh, and it was given that shape in order to facilitate the control of the country by France, which happened to be have the UN mandate. The neighboring country, Iraq, was also given an art shape that was to facilitate control by England. And the shape of both of the countries was designed to make it hard for either of them to dominate the region. So you start with that. You're not dealing with the United States that has a founding father and a long <coughs> history. Secondly, it's a country that is divided into many ethnic groups, a multiplicity of ethnic groups. And that means that it is very, you can't, an election doesn't give you the same results as in the United States, because every ethnic group votes for its own people. So, so you're right back to where you started. Uh, uh, you don't get a national consensus. Moreover, these ethnic groups <coughs> are very antagonistic to each other. Uh, so you have Kurds, Druzes, uh, Alawites, Sunnis, uh, but there are about 10 to 12 Christians, uh, ethnic groups. And, uh, and uh, they've been governed for the last 20 years by the Alawite minority, which is about 13%. <coughs> Uh, but most of the army, or much of the army, is Alawite because Alawites were in the poor region, and therefore joining the army was a way of coming up in the world. So even they had only 13% of the population, they had 80% of the army. Uh, you don't understand what's going on unless you understand that. In addition, most of the other minorities supported the Alawites uh, only because they were afraid of the Sunnis, not because they liked the Alawites. And the Assads are, of course, an Alawite uh, military family. Uh, for the current Assad who is there, one can have this degree of sympathy. He started out in life as an ophthalmologist. The height of his ambition was to practice ophthalmology. He didn't want to govern in Syria. He was in, in London for four years with his wife practicing his profession. When his brother, who was supposed to succeed the father, was killed in an automobile accident. And he was brought back to Syria. So 
he's described in our media as the bad guy, and that's largely true, but he's also incompetent and unsuited uh, for that office on, on those grounds, because you have to assume if you make ophthalmology your profession, this is not that you're driven by a huge <laughs> hunger for power. So, uh, uh, so then uh, the revolution breaks out. And uh, in the American press, it's described as a conflict between democracy and a dictator. And the dictator is killing his own people, and we've got to punish him. But that's not what's going on. Uh, it may have been started by a few Democrats, but on the whole, it is an ethnic and sectarian conflict. And one had to add another thing. The Alawites are Shiites. And uh, so that's enmeshed in the historic Shiite-Sunni conflict. So however it started, and whatever happened in the first three weeks, uh, it is now a civil war uh, between sectarian groups. And I have to say, uh, we have misunderstood it from the beginning. The, if you need our media, they say, we've got to get rid of Assad. And if we get rid of Assad, then we form a coalition government. Uh, inconceivable. I mean, I'm all in favor of getting rid of Assad. Uh, but the, the dispute between us and the Russians on that issue was that the Russians say, uh, you start with getting rid of not just Assad, that's not the issue, but you break up the state administration. And you'll wind up like in Iraq, uh, that there is not, nothing to hold, hold it together. And then you'll have an even worse civil war. So this is how that mess had taken uh, uh, the present form. There are three possible outcomes, an Assad victory, a Sunni victory, or an outcome in which the various nationalities agree to coexist together, but in more or less autonomous regions, so that they can't oppress each other. Uh, that's the outcome I would prefer to see. Uh, and that's the one, uh, but that's not the popular view. Uh, I don't see, if you put either of these sectarian groups in charge, there'll be a bloodbath. Uh, while, and uh, so if one wants a humane outcome, I also think Assad ought to go, but I don't think it's the key. The key is it's like Europe after the Thirty Years' War, uh, when the various Christian uh, groups had been killing each other, until they finally decided that they had to live together, but in, uh, in separate units. So that is the fundamental issue. And we're beginning to move towards that. Uh, but it's going to be very tough. On top of it, it's the fact that the Iranian problem, uh, the Iranians are, have, their, have a quasi-terrorist, I would say terrorist force in Lebanon, uh, which is Shiite. They have now intervened on the, uh, uh, on, on the uh, Alawite, namely Shiite side. Uh, but I don't, and then you have a Kurdish unit in the north that wants to break off. It is a really tough issue. Uh, and uh, I think we're now 
beginning to head uh, uh, towards uh, a, com a conference. But what is almost inconceivable to me is that you can form a national coalition government where they then govern together and have their writ run through the whole country. Uh, what will probably happen is that uh, uh, that the country will uh, lose its unitary character that has also problems uh, because it may risk that one of these units gets captured by terrorists and the terrorists are already very active. Uh, they had Fuller on the Shiite side and uh, various Al-Qaeda groups. Uh, so that's a description uh, uh, of the situation. What the United States can do now, I think we are trying to head it in the direction that I described. Uh, but we have to define an outcome. Nobody knows what we really want that can be achieved. And so until we do that, and then line up some other countries with us. It's going to be very amorphous. So Henry, l let me do a follow-up question with you. When you look around the world and you see <coughs> uh, North Korea, and you see China, which you've written a lot about. Uh, if you haven't read the uh, China book, it's, uh, wor it's worth the effort. So we have Iran, we have Iraq, we have Afghanistan, we have Syria. You know, it's uh, interesting. We have civil unrest in, in Brazil. We have uh, civil unrest in Greece. And the, and, and the problems exist in different places for <coughs> different reasons. But my question to you is this. Is, is there something that you would prescribe that we need to do as a nation to better live in this world of what seems like increasing instability? Are there different approaches we could take in our foreign policy and our economic policy that would, would uh, promise more hope for the coming generation? Uh, I'll answer the question in a minute. I want to pick out of the list of topics you mentioned one about which I'm beginning to be a little optimistic, which is the least probable, uh, namely North Korea. That is probably the worst regime that exists anywhere uh, in the world, the most brutal, the most exploitative. Uh, uh, they, every house has a radio which they can't shut off so that the government can talk to them 24 hours uh, <clears throat> a day. Uh, and they have impoverished their people and submitted them to starvation, uh, or to get nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think now we in China are coming together on that nuclear issue with North Korea. And if that happens, then we may see an evolution that will make it very tough for that regime well, to, to continue as it is. Uh, that's the only positive side. But the fundamental question you asked is, there's so much turmoil in the world. Uh, uh, what's the reason? Well, this is the first period in history where every part of the world affects every other part, and where they can watch it being affected. So uh, th therefore, events have a tendency of multiplying in a way that wasn't conceivable before. The Roman Empire, which was a great empire, and the Chinese Empire existed in almost total ignorance of each other. They knew there was something there, but they had next to no uh, contact. <clears throat> and
And this went on until the beginning of the 19th century. Then the Europeans took over the world as a colonial system. But this is the first time now that you have different parts of the world with their own identity acting in a way that others with their identity have to react to. So that has a multiplier effect uh, built into it. Secondly, uh, the <coughs> nature of the modern communication system facilitates the coming together of groups that share nothing except their resentments. So uh, uh, that creates uh, a quest for excitement and for not looking for solutions, but looking for some event and for some uh, fulfillment. So you now have uh, non-state actors, like these terrorist groups, uh, but also others that have tremendous impact in their society, so that governments get preoccupied with dealing with these, uh, uh, with these groups. Then uh, there's an issue that I personally believe, but uh, your generation will probably resent. Uh, I think that the way that the people who are educated by the internet have a different mind than the others because they can get their information in bits and pieces. They don't have to reflect about it in the traditional way. Uh, so when you look at the leaders that emerge all over the world, they're hugely sensitive to public opinion. Even when they're dictators, they take uh, constant uh, uh, they take constant polls. <coughs> then you have societies. Uh, take China now. They're going to move 400 million people from the countryside into the cities. First, that's a huge technological infrastructure problem. But secondly, if history teaches anything, it is that when peasants leave the countryside and move into apartment houses and into cities. They change their values from the countryside values to city values. But how can any government know ahead of time which direction that takes? And now you see all of this evolution. You mentioned Brazil. Uh, what also seems to be happening is when you look at the per capita income, uh, when these development pro projects start, they're mostly about infrastructure that's big and you can have huge programs. But once you get per capita income above 6,000, you have a lot of little uh, uh, enterprises which are uncontrollable by total planning. I was meeting with a group the other day about China, and we always read about the SOEs, these uh, government-supported and sponsored enterprises. And to my amazement, it emerged that there are only 400 of those that are run by the, by the central government and 123,000 that are run by local government, cities, provinces. Uh, that produces automatically. Uh, now, in states that are less disciplined, so, so you have a lot of turmoil. Uh, 
uh, around the world. But on the positive side, of course, mankind has never had such a tremendous explosion of relative <coughs> being as you have now. Henry, I think they want us to uh, see if we can take a few questions from the audience. So I wonder if we could uh, do that now. Do we have? Yes. Today, President Obama was in Berlin and discussing the uh, potential to shut down Guantanamo. <coughs> and I'd like to know what both of your thoughts are and where you think we might be best uh, served moving those prisoners. Uh, I have not, my basic instinct, I have not thought it through because when I see pictures of Guantanamo, I'm not thrilled by it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, here we have, usually in a war, you take prisoners and you return them when the war ends. This is a war that doesn't, see, that doesn't end. And we have found that maybe 70% of the prisoners we have released have come back to terrorist activities. Uh, so you've got to put them somewhere. Uh, and when the president was considering uh, closing it right away, they were exploring various state prisons, or federal prisons. Nobody wanted them. No state wanted them. And you'd have colossal other problems if you help people. Uh, now, of course, if there are mistakes made, then it's a tragedy. But the criticism isn't uh, mistakes. <laughs> Usually, om almost invariably, uh, these are people connected with, with terrorist activities. Uh, so <coughs> I'd prefer another solution. Uh, but if the tr if nobody can come up with another solution, I'd rather keep it than abolish it and turn them all loose again. Okay. Uh, I just think you're connecting back to China and before President Ford and when you were uh, in the Nixon administration and uh, the opening to China occurred in a striking way under a president who was perceived as anti-China, anti-communist. The perception was what happened, nothing like that would ever happen. And reminisce with us a bit about how that came about, the opening and initial discussions <coughs> with China. And then if you could give a view of the role of China in the modern world now, that's a big question in terms of the future of China in the global geopolitical uh, scene? Well, uh, Nixon was an anti-communist ideologically, but he was also a great patriot. And he looked at the international situation from the point of view of what the, does the country need now. When he took over, <coughs> The country had been for four and a half years in the Vietnam War. It had already suffered 35,000 uh, casualties. And he thought his job was, on the one hand, to bring the war to an end, but on the other, to give the American people a positive vision of the world, other than just ending a war. And he concluded uh, that here were 800, at that time, China had 
800 million people that were not part of the world anymore and that it was essential to bring them into the international system. So he made that decision fairly, very early in his term. Uh, but we didn't know how to do it at first because the Chinese were in the middle of the Cultural Revolution and they had called all their diplomats back. Uh, there was only one embassy in Europe, uh, in Warsaw, where we occasionally had, uh, had contact with them. So the first problem we had was, how do you reach the top level Chinese? Uh, we thought at first we'd go to the most independent-minded communists we knew, which were the Romanians, who had been hostile to, to Brezhnev. So we went to the Romanians, and uh, they did send messages, but the Chinese didn't trust any communists, <laughs> even though they were themselves, but they didn't trust any communists that was related to Moscow. So I won't go through all the byways we had to go. We finally uh, went to the Pakistanis, uh, who we knew had relations with them, and we sent a uh, message via the Pakistanis uh, that we wanted to talk. And up to that point, there had been a, a contact in Warsaw at which there had been 167 meetings, distinguished by the fact that they had made no progress whatsoever, <laughs> because each side raised all kinds of technical problems. Uh, the thing for which the Nixon administration deserves special credit is that they say, let's scrub all these. We uh, want to discuss the basic uh, relationship. Uh, so we exchanged, and the way we exchanged messages was like from a spy story. Uh, we are used to mess to texting. Uh, in those days, they wrote out their messages to us by hand and delivered them in Pakistan. And Pakistan then sent a messenger or envoy over with the message. We answered, typed on unmarked, unsigned, unaddressed paper. So if the Chinese showed it, we could uh, uh, deny it. Uh, and uh, uh, so this went on for nearly uh, for nearly three years until we came together and. Uh, and I was sent to uh, to Beijing as the envoy of the president, and I was sitting there for forty-eight hours without any communication. And you know, I could have finished the Nixon presidency uh, if I screwed up. Uh, but there was one maybe amusing. Uh, aspect to this. Uh, every visitor going to China would have was dying to see Mao. My problem was the opposite. Uh, I knew that Nixon wanted to be the first person to meet Mao. And so I find myself in Beijing and we now know from the records that Mao had given instructions that the minute I asked to see him, I should be brought to him. Uh, and he didn't want to be in a position of asking me to see him. So he had given those instructions, but I never asked. <laughs> <laughs> so I must be the first person who went to Beijing refusing. So I saw Zhou and Lai as my major as the person I dealt with until after the Nixon visit. 
After that, I met uh, uh, Mao uh, five times. Uh, so it was a very convoluted process. But our basic conviction was you cannot have peace in the world if a large percentage of the human population is not exchanging ideas with the other. And if you look at the records of our conversations, uh, the first four or five meetings that I conducted there sound like college professors exchanging views about history because we had decided, let's put all the technical issues aside for the moment, you know, claims and assets and all the, uh, the issues that divide us. Uh, we spent, <coughs> I spent most of my time saying, here is what we think about foreign policy and about the world. And I made an effort to give him a very accurate account so that if something happened on a day-to-day -day basis, they had a basis for comparison. And as it turned out, we were lucky that Cho and Lai also did the same thing. And what it shows is, uh, if you ask me the basic principle of negotiation, should be not to haggle about what causes the disagreement, but to make sure that each side understands where the other one comes from. Because then they can, I don't know whether you'd agree with that in business, but uh, uh, what I've learned from that, I usually begin a negotiation by telling the opposite number what I want to achieve and why. Because then it certainly is, in the Chinese case, turned out to be the right approach. So, um, Dr. Kissinger, you haven't talked about the Iranian nuclear program yet. I see that as one of the biggest issues we've got to deal with. What should we do and what do you think is going to happen? It's a huge issue. <coughs> uh, first, we have said now, together with five other permanent members of the Security Council, for 15 years, that this is unacceptable. <coughs> and for 15 years, we have said that uh, no method is off the table. Now, if suddenly they emerge with nuclear weapons, our position would be very, very difficult. Secondly, if Iran, the process of nuclear proliferation must stop, because if it continues, uh, when I think of what was required in a two-power nuclear world, in terms of warning systems, safety systems, protecting command and control to prevent the war. And then you imagine 50 countries maneuvering simultaneously without the technology. Uh, it's almost guaranteed then that a nuclear war somewhere will start, which could produce hundreds of thousands of casualties uh, in hours. Uh, when you look at 9-11, it discombobulated us, but there were only 3,000 dead, no wounded, no damage to infrastructure. Uh, <coughs> it was bad enough. So this is uh, uh, one thing. Secondly, Iran is right now supporting uh, many terrorist groups all over the world. Uh, if they now, on top of it, have nuclear weapons and feel protected, uh, third, they have already proclaimed that they want to exterminate uh, uh, 
uh, Israel. But I would urge those of you who want to understand how Shiite theologians think, uh, they really believe they are fulfilled. I'm not saying they want to die in a nuclear war, but they have fewer restraints than uh, uh, most others. So I think keeping, uh, if, if Iran moved towards nuclear weapons, it's very probable that Israel will attack, or very likely. Uh, <clears throat> so, so what happens? Uh, I would say we are in the last year where you can still say a negotiation can conceivably succeed. Because with every year, they're accumulating more and more fissile material. Uh, with every year, it becomes harder to see whether they're building uh, uh, nuclear warheads. And most scientists believe that if, I don't know, six months, nine months, if they keep accumulating fissile material, it will be almost impossible to trace it uh, back. Uh, so we will see what happens now. Uh, but if nothing happens, the president will have to make some really tough decisions. But we cannot want to be in another war. But we cannot want them to have nuclear weapons either. Do you have any thoughts on the deadlock in Congress? Oh. <laughs> you know, I, when I was in government, I thought life was rough. Uh, <laughs> but in those days, you still had committee chairmen. Don't you think, Paul? Three or four times a year, you could go to them and say, look, this is not a partisan issue. The country needs it. And I would say 60 to 70% of the time, you could have a bipartisan outcome. That doesn't seem to be happening now. And uh, uh, I don't know, theoretically, you would like a more bipartisan approach. But the way, the number of, the way campaigns are now conducted, people need so much money that they get financed more by pressure groups. In the House, which has 432 seats, maybe 50 of them are contested. All the others are so completely in the hands of one party. Uh, I've seen statistics, I may be wrong, about when Ford ran for the presidency, I think over 20 states were considered contested. Now it's six to eight, all the others so that then puts tremendous uh, emphasis on divisiveness in those states where you're trying to move the few. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, it's deeply concerning. So I, I let, I'm going to have the final word, Henry. I, I think the answer is we're one great leader away from regaining our balance. So what do I mean by that? You know, our system, if you go back to the uh, time we spent together in the government, uh, Richard Nixon, a Republican, uh, created the Environmental Protection Agency, the uh, OSHA for worker safety, reopened, reopened our country to China, proposed the first negative income tax. For you young people, you probably don't know what that means. but. It was uh, a, an unbelievably progressive idea in the late 1960s and early 1970s. 
And if <coughs> Wilbur Mills, who was then the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, hadn't decided he wanted to run for president, we probably would have gotten rid of a whole lot of things that still persist and have a clean, straightforward, simple way to provide economic assistance to low-income people. You know, so I think where we are is, is largely a function of leadership or, or not leadership. Uh, there's, God knows there are things we need to do. So I'll end, end on that note, on a, on a public policy note that uh, was one of the reasons I got fired. You know, it was clear to me and has been for a long time, we need fundamental tax reform in our country. So I'll tell you a few facts. Right, right now, our tax system is such a mess in the way it's designed that it's significantly unenforceable. And so by best estimates, <coughs> we're under collecting taxes that in theory are due and owing to the tune of $400 billion a year. And it cost us someplace between three and $400 billion a year on a total economic impact basis to our people to administer this tax system. So do you think we're smart enough to engineer a tax system that collects the money we need in a clear, straightforward, simple, fair way that collects the money we need to pay for agreed public purposes without a $700 billion hole? I personally believe it's a really significant issue in, in not just in economic efficiency, but I think if you look at societies that unravel or have difficulty going forward, you know, a significant re reason is because the people are really not attached to their government. So if you look at some European countries that have fallen on hard times, you know, the national sport is tax <laughs> avoidance or evasion. And so at that most fundamental level of connection where we're all somehow connected to the fabric of government, we, we've got, you know, what, what I believe is uh, proof positive uh, that we deal with every way, every day in our tax system that, that we're not an intelligent people because intelligent people wouldn't have the system. So, Henry, would you like to end with some humor? You have a wonderful sense of humor. <laughs> Hen Henry is, I tell you what, if you don't know about Henry's humorous quotes, you need to go on Google and read about power. Uh, but this, it's like, uh, an event that occurred to me once where a lady came up to me at the reception and, and said, I understand you're a fascinating man. She said, fascinate me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Well, sir, I think it is fair to say that your candor and your insights have certainly fascinated all of us. And so I would like to, uh, before I again thank our very special guests this evening, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here. We have been delighted to have you join us. But it is a special pleasure to again thank Dr. Kissinger and Mr. O'Neill for their candid insights. We clearly face a huge number of policy challenges in so many arenas, and I think this conversation has elucidated them in a number of very important ways. We very much appreciate you sharing generously your perspectives and your insights. So please join me in, again, thanking our very special guests.